Hi, everyone, and welcome to this event looking at how data can help improve women's access to sexual, reproductive, and maternal health services during this COVID-19 crisis. I'm Natalie Donbeck, Editorial Associate and Reporter here at DAVEX, joining you all from Barcelona, Spain. And I'm very excited to have you all join us today from wherever you are across the world. And I also encourage you to join us online using the hashtags gender data and hashtag DevX event. This conversation is part of a series of virtual events hosted by DevX in partnership with Facebook. And over the past few weeks, we've been digging into different ways data can be used to mitigate the impact of COVID-19 on women and girls specifically. For example, we've looked at how data can be used to increase access to care for women and girls, how it can help inform gender-based violence interventions, but also how data can help us understand the pandemic's effect on women's mental health, amongst other things. But today we're here to discuss how COVID-19 has affected women's access to services such as maternal health and family planning. But we're also going to look into some really interesting ways that data can help tackling some of these issues. So how has the COVID-19 pandemic affected women's access to some of these crucial services? Um, while data on new gaps in sexual and reproductive health care is still largely anecdotal, I want to share some predictive data with you all that I think really captures the scope of the situation right now. If our producers could, yeah, please pull that up. Great. So UNFPA estimates that more than 47 million women could lose access to contraception during this pandemic, internally leading to 7 million unintended pregnancies in the coming months. And Mary Stobus International has warned that the loss of access to contraception and safe abortion could in turn result in between 1.2 and 2.7 million unsafe abortions. Um, so countries grappling with the COVID-19 pandemic have in many cases been forced to divert significant resources away from regular service delivery towards the COVID-19 response. And this means that many of the crucial services that women depend on might be compromised or difficult to access also because of transport disruptions and lockdown measures. In addition, border closures and supply chain disruptions have already affected the availability of contraceptives in many countries. And movement restrictions can also prevent women from going to clinics or pharmacies to access these products, especially in places where family planning isn't deemed essential. We also have a lot of expectant mothers who find it difficult to know whether it's safe or not to deliver in hospital. Some of them fear they might get separated from their partners or of course the risk of being infected. So instead, some women choose to give birth at home where medical complications are often much more dangerous. So today we're going to dig a little bit deeper into some of these issues. Um, we're also gonna look at some really interesting solutions that are coming out of this crisis including how organizations are using data to adapt their services to ensure they can still reach women with these crucial services. And before we begin today's conversation, I just wanted to share a few quick notes on today's event. The event will last about an hour and there will be time for some Q&A at the end. So please make sure to submit your questions using the Q&A box just at the bottom of your screen. And you can use that same box to always alert a member of our team in case you run into any technical difficulties. And finally, today's, record is, today's event is being recorded, so you don't need to worry about scrabbling down notes or missing anything. We'll make sure to send you a recording of it afterwards. So today I'm joined by a great panel of experts. And first of all, I wanted to introduce you to Dr. Renee Stafford, who's the Senior Medical Advisor at Touch Foundation, which provides emergency transport to expectant mother, mothers um, through their program M Mama, operating in Tanzania. We also got Ramon Shrestha, who's the Evidence to Action Manager at Marie Stopas International in Nepal. It's an NGO providing family planning services to women in 37 countries. We also got Pauline Trott with us today, who's the Acting Director of Strategy, Organizational Development, and Performance at International Planned Parenthood Federation Africa. And it's one of the largest NGOs promoting sexual and reproductive health across the globe. And last but not least, we've got Emily Tasher, who's the product manager for analytics at M Pharma, an acro-based social enterprise working with pharmacies to increase patients' access to high quality and affordable medicines through the use of data specifically. So a warm welcome to you all and thanks so much for, for joining me online today. I'm really excited for this conversation. Um, and first of all, I wanted to um, dig a little bit deeper into what women are actually facing on the ground 
So Paula and I, I wanted to turn to you. Um, we've already seen estimates around the numbers of women potentially affected by this crisis, but could you help paint a picture of what you're currently seeing on the African continent? How has the pandemic affected uh, women and girls' access to sexual and reproductive health services, really? Okay, thank you, Natalie. And the COVID pandemic, the COVID nineteen pandemic is putting huge pressure on the health systems around the world and in significantly affecting reproductive and maternal health services delivery to the most vulnerable population, uh, many composed of women and, and young girls in South Southern Africa region, and many in, in the humanitarian context. The measure taken in the Sub-Saharan African country to limit the spread of a virus has had a negative effect on the sexual and reproductive health and rights, including the maternal health and uh, services delivered to the vulnerable and underserved population. And the government a closure of school in many countries has affected the delivery the, of uh, comprehensive sexuality education in school and sexual and reproductive health services in the youth centers, hence for resulting in low client turnout. With school close, there has been a huge increase in planning teen pregnancies, such as in the case or in Kenya, where between January and May 2020, a government report indicates that approximately 4,000 teen, teenage girls were pregnant in Machakos counties in East Kenya. This crisis is most likely being replicated in other parts of the continent. And this point uh, to the clear need for full implementation of comprehensive sexuality education, not only in Kenya, but across the African continent. In IPPF Africa region, more than 60% of sexual and reproductive health and rights services are provided full non-static service delivery points. And in many African countries, the lockdown measure did slow service delivery down significantly. Our member association continue to report in C a, an increasing number of SGBV cases reported by women in the community. IPPF uh, member association, for instance, in, in DRC received 275 cases in just one month with 98% of the cases reported by women and girls. To counter this member association are creating national and community awareness. They have used news release, newspaper article in community prevention activities and women champion and peer leaders offering mobile phone counseling to combat the SGBV. On the other hand, in this in such difficult time, uh, many girls are being reported to have been sold out, uh, with our family receiving bright price to cope with the harsh economic time in violation of the rights of the girls. Thank you. Thanks so much for, for sharing that, Paula. And, and next, I wanted to turn to you, Renee, um, to talk a little bit about the impacts on maternal health specifically. Um, already before this pandemic, we saw around 800 women die every day from preventable causes related to pregnancy and childbirth. But how has COVID-19 affected women's access to maternal health services? And can you tell us a little bit more about how it's affected the MMAMA program specifically and your ability to, to reach women? Sure, thank you, Natalie. I think there are several things here that uh, mirror what Pauline said. Um, Tanzania is right next door to Kenya. Um, we've heard similar stories about young girls um, ending up getting pregnant during um, the time that school has been out. School just recently restarted here in the country. Um, we know that at least in the region that we're working in currently, which is mostly rural, um, access to some services has been challenged, particularly in the fact that some of the health centers that we work with actually were turned into COVID treatment centers. 
So women who would normally access antenatal care, labor and delivery, and postpartum care would have to go to other facilities. So that makes it challenging for women, obviously, they need to know that center is no longer available to them at the time. And then they also need to manage transportation, which in rural areas is quite a big challenge. Um, and then as to MMAMA, so the MMAMA program is a program here in Tanzania and starting now in Lesotho that provides emergency transportation for pregnant women women during labor and women who are postpartum up to six weeks post-delivery, as well as newborns up to six del weeks delivery, provides free emergency transportation, either from their village to a health facility or from one health facility to another when a government ambulance is not available. We've been lucky in the fact that we do have access to data so our transportation system is run via a 24-7 dispatch center um, with a digital application that then dispatches the ambulance and the drivers. And we have a real-time dashboard. So we're actually able to track women's access to the emergency transport. And so far, we've not seen any fall off in the, in the ability of women to access the service. It's a 24 our toll-free number provided by Vodafone. So we're quite lucky in that sense. And the data has helped us track that. That's great. Yeah, thanks so, so much, Renee. And I wanted to move over to the supply chain issue now. And, and Emily, I wanted to ask you, how have the knock-on effects of the pandemic affected supply chains in the countries where M Pharma operates? And how has it affected specifically access to contraceptives? Thanks, Natalie. So yeah, as you as you're alluding to, M Pharma is in the pharmacy supply and retail business. So we're kind of looking at this from the other side as some of the other presenters. So from our side, we've definitely seen some quite substantial shocks to the market during this time. Um, I think most importantly to highlight is we've just seen a lot of changes in supply and a lot of products have been really severely limited, especially in the months of February, March, and April. It's getting a little better now, but it's, it's a gradual recovery. Um, what we've heard is that it's largely due to changes in manufacturing with many factories working at much lower capacity than usual, which causes much longer lead times for products. And also due to the general uncertainty of the situation, which makes importers and distributors push for a lot more aggressive terms. So where we used to get two to three months to pay back some of our suppliers, they shifted to asking for cash immediately on delivery of products. We did at the same time see some drop in demand. Um, and it's, it's a little hard for us to tease out what the different impact of the two sides is on sales. But what's very clear is that the changes in supply did cause fulfillment rates to drop substantially. So here at M Pharma, for instance, in Ghana, we were getting only about 25 to 30% of what we were ordering from suppliers. And when that's the case, there's just no way that we can provide full fulfillment to the pharmacies that we work with. But on the side of reproductive health and contraception, the, the story is a little bit more nuanced. So on one hand, we did see this general trend of limited supply, for instance, in the sales of emergency contraceptives in Ghana. So a couple of popular brands of emergency contraceptives became unavailable from almost all suppliers. And that seems to have carried pretty directly through to sales, which dropped off steeply. So in March, at the lowest point, sales were at only 44% of the quantity we had sold in January. And as of last month, that had risen back up to 71% of the January figures, but still a substantial drop. But then on the other hand, we saw a kind of different story with some small rural shops that we work with in Nigeria, where over the same period, we actually saw sales of emergency contraceptives triple. So very opposite effect. And one key thing to point out there is that those supplies came through an NGO partner of ours, SFH, the Society for Family Health, who is our partner in a Gates Foundation project there. 
So there's some indication that players who maybe don't have to manage budgets quite so closely, like well-funded nonprofits and, and probably some governments were able to weather the shock or protect patients from the shock a bit better than some of the for-profit suppliers. So that might have helped with access to contraceptives in some cases. Yeah, thanks so much for sharing that, Emily. That's a really, really interesting overview. Um, and Rahman, I know that Murray Stopas has actually managed to keep your contact center in Nepal open through the, through the lockdown. Um, so I wanted to ask, what needs did you see women call with during the pandemic? And can you tell us more about how Murray Stopas has adapted to ensure that you can still deliver these services during these times? Um, thanks. Um, yeah, so I think initially when the lockdown began, I think the uncertainty surrounding what was allowed and what was not allowed was really difficult for the people as well as for us. Um, it took some time for us to get responses from the government in terms of what we could and couldn't do. And I think clients really struggled to know um, what the guidelines allowed them to do because you are allowed to go out for emergency services, but they don't know if safe abortion and family planning falls in that category. And um, because safe abortion is such, has such confidential and privacy issues, it would, it would be quite difficult for a lot of women to actually have an official permission and go through the entire process to go and get services. So um, we saw a lot of calls in our contact center about women wanting access to safe abortion services uh, and also family planning as well to a certain extent. But yeah, due to the lockdown, um, they were not able to go to their regular providers and even we were closed for a week. So it was really difficult. I mean, within the first week, we saw 750 calls to our contact center and over a third of them about were from a woman who wanted a safe abortion service. So we really had to pivot really quickly and try to get our centers back open. And um, we did that within one week, 18 of our centers were open and we started providing services. But from our contact center, I think it was really crucial in terms of data that the contact center was really our way to monitor how our system was working because we were booking appointments in the contact center and only two thirds of the women were actually being able to come to our centers. So we used some of this data to lobby the government to try to come up with interim guidelines where we could try to focus on safe abortion at home because as we know, um, getting safe abortion services can be quite time sensitive. So in terms of that, I think we, that really helped us push that, um, the process to give, give us that permission. And um, we started doing that now as well. So. Yeah, we really had to try to think of different creative ways, including going to quarantine sites to do some counseling. And from that, we've seen that to convert it to services as well. So it's been challenging, but yeah, but it's been a very interesting learning experience as well. Yeah, that's great. Thanks for sharing that. Um, yeah, and, and Pauline, I wanted to hear from you as well. I know the effects of the pandemic, as we've said, you know, are still largely to be felt um, when it comes to indicators such as maternal health. Um, but what role can data actually play in helping to identify these gaps um, and also ensure that as we build back, um, these services can be better prepared to withstand um, further other pandemics and, and other shocks? Okay, thank you, Natalie. And in IPPF in general, the data use guide the intervention of the Federation in sexual and reproductive health and rights and to make sure that we effectively reach a most vulnerable population, which are essentially composed of women and young girls. So knowing the, that during such situation of COVID-19, we have pro proliferation of information, accurate or non-inaccurate information, at the early stage of a pandemic, a, the IPPS set up a COVID-19 task force, a global task force to coordinate the information and action from the member association on the COVID-19. And to have a better understanding of the effect of the COVID-19 pandemic in the member association, the Federation regularly conducts impact survey in our uh, MAs. And since March 2020, IPPL conducted two impact surveys one in March and another one in May 2020 to generate evidence and insight. And these findings are used to guide the decision of IPPF management, uh, which is also advised by the COVID-19 task force to put in place a, a more response from the Federation towards the COVID-19. And furthermore, the finding has been used to increase the engagement of some key donors like Global Affairs Canada, the Levi's Trust, the Danish government, G20, 
GFID and to support the response to the IPPF, uh, to the response of IPPF to the COVID-19. So uh, furthermore, the data are supporting IPPF to better respond to the increased need of the personal, for the personal protective equipment for the service provider and the community agent. As I told you, a majority of our intervention is out of a static uh, a service delivery point and also to strengthen the prevention measure for our clients. The data also support uh, uh, the, continue to meet, uh, the continuity to meet the need of our beneficiary by keeping our youth center program uh, open and also to maintain an online and mass media awareness program for area where the internet is not yet so accessible to the population. And uh, the data also help us to continue uh, to supply the reproductive health uh, products, including the contraceptive and also the emergency contraceptive. And finally, to strengthen the information and service provision through the use of technology, such as a virtual counseling, virtual education section, session or digital health, including creation of application that can be used offline to reduce digital inequality in the community. So, but uh, in general, since the COVID-19 pandemic has started, in the Federation, we have also intensified a cross learning, virtual learning between the member association and using the micro site that we have and also having the regular webinar in English and also in French on, on reproductive health and, and maternal health. Thank you. Great, thank you. And Renee, I just quickly wanted to go back to maternal health. Um, a lot of global health leaders that the DevEx has spoken to in the past few weeks um, have raised concerns about gains in, in maternal health um, being reverted as a result of the pandemic. So I wanted to ask, you know, what kind of support um, and perhaps data plays a role in that? What kind of support is needed in ensuring that the pandemic actually doesn't push back some of these positive strides that we've gained recently when it comes to maternal health? Well, I, I think there are a number of them. And I think um, the first thing that you've heard from everybody on the panel is that you have to be nimble. You have to be able to pivot uh, your existing programs to make up for the gaps that rapidly occur. And so whether that's providing just PPE equipment and training for the programs and the people that you're working with as a start, I think that's really a key thing. And then thinking about your programs and really being nimble and knowing what's happening on the ground, even when you're not there. So for instance, um, where we work in the geographic areas we work with, all of the implementing partners, as well as the government and the regional health management teams and district health management teams are on a WhatsApp group. So very simple kind of digital sharing of information that rapidly let us know, know what was happening on the ground, what the government was thinking in terms of healthcare, what was being shifted around, what could happen and what couldn't was really, really valuable. So I think that obviously we had started before this happened, but I think having good information sharing mechanisms that don't have to be high tech are really valuable. And knowing that and knowing what the government was doing. So Tanzania is different than many other countries in that we didn't have a very full lockdown. Schools were closed, flights were canceled, international flights were canceled, borders were closed, but business happened. Uh, there was a big focus on hand washing, wearing masks, social distancing, but um, other than that, businesses still happened. You couldn't visit a government office without wearing a mask and washing your hands. And that has continued even as things are slowly opening up. That being said, the shift in various things in, in the government and the local, particularly where we work in rural areas, did cause some challenges. So we have, and this I think gets to, you know, how do you, how do you ensure that women and their partners um, have access to maternal health? And we have a community engagement program with our partner Pathfinder. 
And all of a sudden, we weren't allowed to have large community engagement group meetings. Um, so we had to work with the local health management teams to figure out how we could still get that knowledge to women about the program, about the danger signs and risk factors in pregnancy, and also let them know that they should still be going to a health facility. They should go for their ANC visits. They should go to deliver in the health facility. And so we had to work around that and change the size of the group, change how the communication happened with the group leaders. Um, and nonetheless, that was still able to go on. So I think being nimble, knowing your program, knowing what's happening on the ground. And if you're not actually there, if you can't travel to that area, then working with your partners on the ground to know what's happening and then change things as you can to make sure that your program can still function well and that women and their partners can still access that important maternal health care. Great, thank you. That's a great tip for all of us, staying nimble. Um, but yeah, Emily, I also wanted to go back to the issue of supply chains um, and talk a little bit more specifically about how Infarma is using data. Um, but yeah, if you could tell us more about how you're using data to ensure partner pharmacies actually match supply and demand of products such as contraceptives, especially now and really the central role that the data has played in, in your model as, as in pharma? Yeah, it's a great question because data is definitely very key to our work at M Pharma. Um, but I, I want to kind of start by saying when we're talking about matching supply to demand, we at M Pharma really want to make sure that we not only have the right amount of the product in the right place, but also have it at the right price. So the two factors that we're generally thinking about a lot are data and scale and they, they really play off each other. So for us, the, the most important data is on demand or sales. And here is where um, we can play quite a central role. So in many of the countries we work in, we're, we're in Ghana, Nigeria, Zambia, Zimbabwe, and Kenya at this point, there are a lot of small pharmacies, each procuring drugs on their own. And those small pharmacies often don't really have the time or the expertise to plan in advance. So when we partner with pharmacies, we first put in good systems to capture data. And then based on those systems, we can, one, aggregate the demand um, and use it to accurately forecast so that we're procuring and transporting drugs to facilities before they reach the point of being out and having an empty shelf. Um, to tie back to your point, Renee, about figuring out ways to use technology to collect data in different places, this is an area we've invested in quite a lot in M Pharma. We've built our own pharmacy management system. And of course, there are a lot of different pharmacy management softwares on the market, but what we found is a lot of them are not fit for this sort of purpose. So for instance, one of the really special things about the system we've done is that it can function offline. Um, and that's, that's something that typically does not happen. So now the power can go out and we continue to collect sales data. That's been a really key aspect for us. We've also built the system to be very simple so that even non-literate users are able to use it. Um, so broadly, it's about getting the right data. And once we have the data, moving from there is, is kind of the easier piece of the puzzle. Um, and I think that goes towards a broader point that in general, you cannot streamline or optimize something if you don't have good data. So really investing in data collection and data collection systems is really useful. Um, I do also want to touch on the aspect of scale because it's, it's really crucial for us. Um, so making sure that we're aggregating demand allows us to get not only that product in place 
um, but also have it be at a price that's affordable for people. And so the more we can aggregate the purchasing power, the more negotiating power we have with manufacturers and distributors, and the better the price we can get for us and for patients. And that kind of feeds back to data because the broader our network, of course, the more data we get and the better our forecasts can be. So it creates a bit of a positive feedback loop where over time, as we build more scale, we get more data, we get better forecasts. And over time, not only get products in the right place at the right time across more places, but also have them be at the right price. Great. Yeah. Thanks for, for sharing that. Um, it's a really interesting model uh, you have at Pharma, And I just wanted to connect back between the supply chains and kind of the disruptions we've seen um, and the decrease in access to contraceptives and safe abortions. You know, what implications will that have on maternal and newborn health in a few months from here? Um, Ramon, may maybe you could speak a little bit to, to that. Sure, I mean, it's, it's quite well documented in the literature about how um, uh, lack of access to contraceptives and having unintended pregnancies can have short-term consequences for the mother's health, as well as long-term consequences in the productivity and the economic stability of the entire family. So if we see women lacking access to contraceptives and safe abortion services now, there's definitely going to be an increase in unintended pregnancies, as you showed in the data before. And uh, some of these unintended pregnancies will be carried to term and we all know the risks associated with carrying a birth to term and if you look at the data a very common reason for uh, wanting a safe abortion service is the um not having the economic ability to take care of that child or provide for it so definitely if you're carrying an unintended pregnancy to term that's going to have effects on how you are, your ability to raise that child in the way that you want as well as affect um, the future of any other children that you may have because now those resources are going to be strained even further and even for women who are wanting to terminate, um, I fear that if we're not during the lockdowns, they're not getting access to services, then a lot of them might uh, get, get into the second trimester where it is much more difficult to access services, especially like in Nepal, there are that, not that many centers that actually provide second term service, second trimester services. So um, the biggest fear is that those women are going to seek some alternative methods, going to non-safe or unsafe services and that can result in complications, as we know. Um, the data in Nepal shows that different studies show that around 7 to 13 percent of maternal deaths are due to complications resulting from abortions. So as you can see, they could have some quite devastating impacts if we don't act. Great, yeah, thank you. Um, and Renee, you already spoke a little bit about how the M Mama team uses data, um, but could you tell us more about how you've been using data specifically during COVID-19 to um, keep these essential emergency transport services? And I know often during these, um, these events, we have smaller NGOs uh, joining us. Sometimes they don't have in-house data capabilities. And do you have sort of a, a tip um, for them in terms of how they could approach data and really get these valuable insights um, in order to make sure they can shift their operations and, and continue to serve women with crucial services. Sure, I think for us, and I'll, I'll go back to um, one of Emily's comments about data and their pharmacy system. Actually, our application also can work offline. And I think if there's anything that we really learn, particularly in rural areas where the internet isn't good, if you're providing an essential service, you need to have some way to have your application, your digital health program platform be able to work offline in concert with regular phone service. And I think that's really, really important. We have invested a lot into this digital platform um, and we've learned quite a bit from it. And because of the fact that the platform also has a dashboard that's real time, we can look at any given point in time. And I think this is the other really key thing for smaller organizations. The ability to look at something in real time and see what's happening is really powerful. You don't have to wait for somebody from the program to call you and say, oh, there's a problem. And so if you don't have a big M&E department, having something like this where your project manager, your program manager can look at that dashboard at any given point in time and say, gee, I wonder how things are going on the ground. We're not there right now. 
what's happening is really, really powerful. So having a real-time dashboard is essential and the ability to work offline is essential. And so we, we have been concerned that there might be a drop off in emergency transports. And we had started to see a, a small drop off even before COVID hit. Um, and because we monitor the dashboard and the data quite frequently, we saw, we saw that there were some drop offs. We were talking to our community partners and we actually had the data and could actually say, no, these drop offs and transports we can't attribute them to COVID. We can attribute them to X, Y, and Z, but not to COVID. So I think that's another really powerful thing for organizations. And it also though helps us spot problems when there are problems. And then we can talk to the people in the districts and say, what's going on at this facility? Why is this patient going from here to there when they should have been able to handle that patient at that facility? And I think that's really powerful. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, and Pauline, I, I wanted to bring you back into the conversation. And as you as you mentioned, you're you're a member of the IPPF Global COVID-19 Task Force um, as the IPPF Africa representative. So I also wanted to ask about the role of data in hel helping make the case for further investments and support in sexual, reproductive, and maternal health care more generally, um, especially during these times of crisis. But um, when a lot of resources are being redirected, um, but how can data actually help support make that case when you speak to policymakers um, and really put these issues at the front? Okay, thank you, Natalie. And uh, you know, the COVID-19 has exposed a weak health system in many African countries. And African governments have uh, grossly under invested in the health sector. There is a need, there is need to invest in the primary health care, which will see well-functioning health system right from the grassroots level. There is urgent need for leaders to honor their various commitments, among them the Abuja Declaration, which required African government to allocate at least 15% of their annual budget to the health sector. Had this been done already, African will have been better able to cautious its women and girls against the arch of the challenges they are facing now. The data gathered during the COVID-19 pandemic will help the civil society to play an effective role in holding African leaders to account. In today's world, we are using technology as uh, I think Rene and Emily mentioned and computer and smartphone to solve most of every need. The lesson learned from the COVID-19 crisis call for great investment in this area by African government and partner. In a recent meeting uh, that IPPF has had with the young leaders in our IPPF network, while they have been producing and sharing messages with thousands of young people through social media, they voice a concern over their inability to reach thousands of other young people in rural or marginalized area, which must, must needed a SRH information. Internet remains unavailable in many areas in the region, yet it is an avenue and that can solve many health challenges in millions of Africans. It is important for policymakers to understand that there is a need to find technological solution to problems. With women and girls bearing the biggest brunt of a pandemic, where they are burdened with a myriad of domestic responsibility, including caregiving, they barely have time to visit the health center, most of which are 10 of kilometers from their homes. It is time to consider options such as teleconsulting, telemedicine in month. Many women have no maids in the family planning refill, restock on the HIV treatment regime and et cetera. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for, for that overview, Pauline. Um, and yeah, thanks really to everyone um, on the panel for sharing those great insights. Um, I also wanted to make sure that we can get to some of the great audience questions that we've, we've had come in 
Um, and I wanted to start uh, with a question for, for you, Renee. We have a person asking, um, with some services, including SRH education, being adapted to online or mobile delivery in recent months, where are there opportunities to collaborate with tech companies going forward to scale up these services and increase access to them, particularly for people in rural areas? Uh, thank you for that question. I think um, there are lots of challenges, particularly in rural areas. Um, internet connectivity isn't always as good as you would like. Um, and in addition to that, at least in rural areas here um, and in the Sutu, most people don't have smartphones. So to try to deliver online education becomes more challenging, um, especially if you want it to be interactive. That's the challenge. Um, you know, people learn by interacting and by doing, so that can be challenging. That being said, there are things that you can do, and there are simple things like SMS messages that can be sent out to all of your clients with information. Uh, the challenge with that is, is that, and you can track to look to see if they looked at it. So you can track that, but what you don't know is if they actually acted on it. Um, and I think that's where the challenges come in. So I think you really need to have a mix of on the ground people in the community, whether they're peer mentors, um, mama mentors, community health workers, you need to have in the rural areas in particular, you need to have those people on the ground that can then follow up with the messages that are being sent. So if you're sending messages, SMS messages, you still need to have people to follow up on the ground to make sure that women understood and their partners understood what those messages were and then knew what to do with them and how to act on them. So just sending a message doesn't really help if they don't know, okay, you should deliver in a health facility, that's great, but where is the nearest one? How can I get there? You know, is it open right now? What are the hours? So I think for me, that's really the biggest piece. You still have to have human interaction to go along with telehealth and digital learning. Great, yeah, thanks so much for that. Um, and Ramon, I think we have a question for, for you here as well. Um, there's someone asking, to what extent has the pandemic impacted trust in the services you're providing? Um, and were there any lessons from previous health crises or emergencies and how to address issues of mistrust among communities? Um, <laughs> that's a bit of a tough one. Uh, to, to the extent that I'm aware, we haven't had really um, had any um, negative experiences in the community. Uh, we are still collecting data on that actually because that was something that we were um, considering as well so in terms of uh, we have this team of ms ladies mary soaps ladies who are one reach one nurse uh, outreach models and they work primarily in very remote mountainous areas and we are following up with them to see how their um, perception of them in the community has changed after they've been providing services and the preliminary data shows that in most cases people are very um, happy and they're very um, comforted by the fact that these women are traveling sometimes up to two to three days to actually reach these villages and provide services. So until now, we have not had any experiences where providers were seen with mistrust or even issues around whether uh, health workers are carrying infections because I have seen that in the media and the news and other places, but uh, we have not had those issues till now, but we are uh, monitoring our workers and their morale quite regularly to make sure that they are um, doing well and that they're not having any negative experiences so far, so. Great, great, thanks for that. Um, and Renee, actually another question for you um, related to technology, but um, we have someone asking, um, when you said you changed the way you communicated, um, how did that actually look like? Did you change um, to use new channels or communication or how did you change what you were already doing? Someone's asking. It wasn't so much that we changed digitally how we communicate. It was more on the ground um, with the community engagement piece. So normally you might have 10 or 12 women being led by a peer mentor in the village, um, talking about risk factors for high risk pregnancies and talking about setting up a birth plan um, talking about danger signs of pregnancy and when to see emergency services. 
because of the large groups that the, our partners usually have uh, for this, they had to switch. So um, the government said you can only have a small number of people. They have to do this physical distancing. You still you had to have hand washing facilities and masks, which were, were always available. That that actually was not an issue. But you're reaching fewer women. Um, and then because you're not going to the field to be part of those community engagement groups, it then requires a lot more phone calls back and forth to the community engagement coordinators in the villages and the peer mentors to really make sure that the engagement is happening and to work out what the challenges are. Great, thank you. Um, and Paula, and we, we had a question come in for you. Um, how have each of your um, organizations um, been adapting services to reach women and girls with disabilities during this time, um, especially given that lockdowns and, and travel restrictions make it even harder for people with disabilities to reach necessary services? Um, so I think, yeah, Poland, if, uh, if we wanna start with you on that maybe. Okay, and thank you, Natalie. I think um, IPPF is a non-discrimination um, organization. So in that way, even before the COVID, uh, we make sure that any client, regardless they are living with disability, they can benefit from the service. But during the COVID-19, uh, what we know, we know that the situation can also fragile the gender issue and also the increase the inequality in the service delivery in such regard we started some partnering with some right-based organization and like amnesty international and also women links uh, worldwide to develop and and to launch and uh, the call to up action to our government uh, through a guideline for the african states to protect the right of women and girls during the COVID-19 pandemic. And I think this also includes the people living with disability. Thank you. Great, thank you. And Raman, would you wanna jump in on that one as well to give us the perspective from Murray Stokes? Yes, so um, yes, this uh, working with persons with disabilities has always been on the forefront of our minds. And even before the pandemic, we've been trying, as Paul mentioned, we've been trying to work really hard with uh, especially local grassroots level um, organizations that work with persons with disabilities and to try to tie up their events and services where, with with our services so that we can actually act, uh, approach them and act, have better access to them because as you know um, sometimes it can be quite difficult to provide physical as well as other different types of uh, facilities for them to be able to access our services but um, during the quarantine we have not really um, seen a lot of referrals as such because of a huge um, increase in need, but we, we, we make sure that we have these links with our the local organization so that our nurses and our outreach teams are always um, ready and available if they do reach out to us for services. Great, thank you so much, Ramon. Um, and Emily, we have a supply chain question for you coming in as well. Um, what changes could be implemented now to prevent shortages of some products such as contraceptives if, there, um, if we're to see a second wave of COVID in some countries or another health pandemic in the future that would lead to similar restrictions as those we've seen in the last few months? Um, and also to ensure it isn't just organizations or governments with big budgets that can access these, um, these products during times of crisis? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, in my mind, it's all about building strong systems. And, and the, it, the great thing about that is that the strong system helps us all the time, but it helps especially in times of pandemics or other shocks like COVID. Um, so for instance, I think it's helped us a lot to have so much data. It's helped us be able to prioritize what to procure and what to supply. And so continuing to build up data systems and things like that can definitely help. I already talked about scale some, but I also think that one is really important here. Um, and I think one thing that's probably important to think about for this audience is partnerships and building public-private partnerships and generally partnerships across silos. Um, 
family planning and sexual and reproductive health is an area that tends to have a lot of verticals, like many priority areas in global health. And certainly there are advantages to that in the short run. Um, but I think in the long run, it's really important to be working to integrate and take advantage of the strengths of different organizations and ultimately come out with a system that works for everything. Because we know like women need more than contraceptives. Women have a wide range of health needs. And so we really need a full strong health system supported by all the players um, and, and work on that of course has already started, but more can start now. Great, thanks so much for, for sharing that. Um, in Poland, we have another question for you. Um, data from the Ebola crisis show that um, more women were choosing to give birth in private facilities as opposed to public ones. Um, and this has implications for equity due to the cost of private facilities. Um, so this person is asking, how do we take into account the possible impact of inequalities in relation to access to maternal care, care when designing our services, um, especially when working to improve data collection? Okay. Um, I think in terms of uh, the quality, in fact, the, the COVID-19 highlighted that um, less women they have access to the public uh, services. And even there was a recent investigation to solve for when you look at the family planning component, it seemed like more women are now switching from the modern to the traditional family planning method because they cannot because of a lockdown and also some restriction so i believe that uh, the quality aspect is a very big challenge in the this this situation and um, the only thing that we are doing currently any data is really important because without the information on the ground you cannot take the effective decision so in this regard we just uh, use any channel of collecting the data, actually we are dealing mainly with more unstructured information through the social media and, and also through some feedback comments. But for we are gradually making it more structured to make sure that it's more accurate and reflect what is happening on the ground. Thank you. Great, thank you. And just another question to follow up with you, Paulin. Um, what more can donors and philanthropy groups uh, do to move the needle on progress in the short term when it comes to COVID-19? What are, what are you asking from some of, some of the donors that you're working with? Okay, you know, and as I was saying, you know, uh, when, to be honest with you, when the COVID-19 started, it was, it was new to all of us. So it was really difficult to approach the donor with some evidence to say, this is the support that we needed. So, and uh, we were trying to use the internal resources to to support the emergency situation. And uh, we have understood that before we get the opportunity to have, to be effective in the discussion with the donor, we need to come up with some tangible evidence. And that's why I mentioned that at the early stage, we launched two uh, impact survey. And uh, we have noticed that the first impact survey was not giving very accurate information, but the second one showed very good information. And also we are using the pool, the pool uh, opportunity, giving the opportunity to the country to share their story, the cases of what they are doing, so that it creates a kind of dynamic within the federation. And so we use all those insights to engage a donor using those evidence to present also the need on the the, the, the crown. So this is the approach that we are using. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Um, and Renee, there's also um, a person asking, um, what key lessons did you learn um, from data gathering that might lead you towards more locally led models? You already mentioned that you've been uh, working very closely um, partners on the ground um, in places where you might not have staff. Um, so could you speak a little bit more to that? Sure, um, and actually, I, I, I'm glad someone asked this question because our model is actually very much locally led um, and in partnership with the local governments. So for instance, the dispatchers who work in the dispatch centers are government employees. They are not on the program payroll. Um, the dispatch centers are set up in the local 
hospitals. They're not somewhere else. They're all embedded actually within the local system. The ambulance drivers are the government ambulance drivers. Um, we use community drivers when the ambulance isn't available in the very rural areas. And in fact, the government is now paying 50% of all transport costs. And in another year, they will be paying 100% and the program is totally owned by the government. So I think this is a really powerful model that we have. And it's what we do and plan for in our, all of our programs. Great, thank you. And I think, unfortunately, that's all we have time for in terms of the audience Q&A. But thanks so much for to everyone who submitted a question. And I'm sorry if we didn't get to your question. Um, but I'd now like to turn to the speakers just for a last quick takeaway. Um, so I wanted to ask, what's the single most important thing that needs to happen to ensure women's access to sexual, reproductive, and maternal health, both during and after this crisis? And I wanted to start with you, Roman. And if we can also get those slides up, um, if our producer could pull those up. Great, thank you. Um, thanks, Andy. Yeah, so it was a bit of a challenge coming up with a, such a, a call to action, but um, for me personally, from my experience working in Nepal, um, the call to action that I chose was reproductive health and rights start with the woman at home. And I went with that for two reasons. I think one way you can look at it as getting services to women's doorsteps where they are able to access services no matter where they are, no matter how remote or what their age or what their um, status. And the other way in which I think this is also uh, significant is that I feel there's a bit of a discrepancy in the way we talk about um, health and family planning and reproductive health in public in our work sphere versus how um, people talk about it in their homes when it comes to your own families and the women in your families. And sometimes there's a bit of a discrepancy and I mean, people talk about there being uh, taboos around uh, talking about sex and stuff, but I feel like at this point, even if you are well-educated and you don't see it as a taboo, there's still an awkwardness to translate that um, understanding of how important family planning and contraception is to women to actually to the people that are in your personal lives and your relatives and your extended family. So I think that is something that we all could do to actually uh, think about how family planning can be more normalized and can be part of something we can talk about and in our personal lives and not just in our work lives as well. So. Great, thank you. And if we go to the next slide, I think we have a call to action for Paulin as well. If I could hand it over to you. Let's see. And uh, yes, our call for action is a sexual, sexual that they have services might be recognized as essential. In fact, the government in Africa must prioritize the health sector in the budget. They must honor the commitment among them, the Abuja Declaration, which will in turn ensure that the health system are functional right at the grassroots level. Doing so will enable the young girls and women including those in marginalized area have access to quality health care as and when they need them. Thank you. Great, thanks so much for that. Um, and then for the next one, we've got Emily, we've got a call to action from you as well that you wanted to share with our audience today. Yeah, so I think there are a lot of factors that play into this, of course, but I, I was trusting the other presenters to bring some of the other angles. And I think that like I was saying before, investing in efficient supply chains for health broadly is a really crucial action for sexual and reproductive health. Um, as we build a more integrated system, we'll be able to keep products in stock more reliably and keep the prices under control. And then when shocks like this happen, we won't find emerging markets in Africa and beyond at the end of the line with manufacturers. We'll be able to be right up front with any other market and get our share of what's being produced. Great, thanks for that, Emily. And Renee, I know we can't see your video, but if you're still with us, I know you had a call to action to share as well. I think it might be your internet in Tanzania and it's not cooperating, um, but thanks everyone. I'm here. Oh, you're here. Great, Renee, yeah. and I'll hand it over. <laughs> yeah, the, 
Great. The, inter the internet's a bit scratchy. Um, so my kind of final thought is really that we need to empower women and their partners with reproductive health knowledge and knowledge about the availability of services and how to access them. Wonderful. Thanks so much for, for sharing that. Um, and I'm afraid that's all we've got time for today, but please make sure to keep an eye out for the two last events in this series. Um, next week, we'll be looking at how data can help advance women's and girls' access to education post-pandemic, so make sure to tune in. Um, and do make sure to also visit the Gender Data Series resource hub that we have for more content on how data can help improve the COVID-19 response for women and girls. And I'd like to thank our amazing speakers for joining us today. Thanks so much for sharing those important insights with, with all of us. And of course, a big thank you to your international audience for dialing in today. And stay safe and, and healthy, everyone, wherever you are. And we hope to see you at another DevX event shortly. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, Ellie. Thanks.